Hey, Pastor Jeremy here. Thank you so much for following along with us today. Before you go any further, we want to ask you to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And then also be sure to hit that notification bell. So anytime we put something new out, you'll get notification for, for your own use, but also to share with your friends and with your family. We also want to direct you to our website at fbcac.org where you can find out all about our church family and what we're up to here at First Baptist Church of Angels Camp. Well, we're about to get into the proclamation of God's Word. If you have any prayer requests or comments, please do leave them in the, in the comments section below. Other than that, hope you enjoy it, and God bless you. Thanks to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7 through 10. We are continuing in our Ephesians uh, sermon series titled, I'm a Saint. And uh, we're answering questions that are in the little pouches of your guys' notebooks for your sermon handouts. And the one that we're on right now is, why worship? And we are going to continue that today, as well as from last week's sermon, Jeremy preached on the blessings that we have of the spiritual blessings that Christ has given us as believers. Um, last week, Jeremy went over that they are we are chosen, we are holy and blameless, we are predestined, we are adopted sons and daughters of God, and we are graciously blessed. And today, we're going to continue in that. We're going to continue in the spiritual blessings that we have as believers. And so we're now going to be going into our text, which is Ephesians Chapter 1, verse 7 through 10, which says this. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he richly poured out on us with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, that he purposed in Christ as a plan for the right time, to bring everything together in Christ both things in heaven and things on earth in him. So we're just going to jump right back into it. We're going to break these down verse by verse. And starting in uh, verse 7 of Ephesians chapter 1, going back to it, it says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. So in Jesus there is redemption. And redemption is the release of people, animals, or property from bondage through the payment of a price. See, redemption goes all the way back to Leviticus chapter 25, verses 47 through 53. When an Israelite became destitute, poor, and was in debt and could not pay his debt, he was able to sell himself into slavery to pay off that debt and work it off. But one of his close relatives in the same clan could redeem him, could buy him back for a specific price that needed to be matched for the many years he had left or his debt or they have some of they added it up. And he could be bought back. See, it's the same with us, which is the first point on your slide, is that in Jesus, we have redemption. You see, Jesus redeemed us in that we were in bondage to sin. We were a slave to sin. And in being a slave to sin, we had a debt that we owed that had to be paid. That debt was debt. That was a debt that we could not and cannot pay. And here's why. Because once we die, that's it. We're dead. That debt has been paid, and then we are now eternally separated from God. We can't resurrect ourselves, so we can't pay that debt. It says in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, For the wages of sin is death, 
but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Where we owed a debt of death, God made a way. Where it says, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. This gift of eternal life is redemption through the blood of Jesus Christ. Because remember, redemption requires a price. We had to be bought back. And Jesus bought us back with his blood. Jesus paid the debt we owed with his blood on the cross. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, or verse 18 through 19 says, For you know that you were redeemed from your empty way of life, inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of an unblemished and spotless lamb. Because Jesus led and was a sinful life, led a, sin, a sinless life, sorry, because Jesus led a sinless life, he was able to pay that debt that we could not pay. Because of his sinless life, he was able to take all of our sins, past, present, and future, upon himself and was able to pay that debt of death. And because Jesus did not stay dead, because he had the power over death, because he is God, he was able to pay that debt that we owed of death. And this is, and this is how Jesus has redeemed us. He has paid that debt of blood of death. And because Jesus has redeemed us, we are now justified. Romans chapter 3 verse 22 through 25 says this, the righteousness of God is through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Since there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. They are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. God presented him as the mercy seat by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his restraint, God passed over the sins previously committed. Because of sin, we have fallen short of God's glory. We have fallen short of God's righteousness, his holiness. And through the redemption that Jesus has given us by his blood on the cross, we are now justified. And when we put our faith and our trust in Jesus, we no longer stand before Jesus as a sinner, as falling short of his glory, of falling short of his righteousness and his holiness. Because he now sees Jesus in us. He no longer sees our sin, our shortcomings. This is all because of the redemption of Jesus Christ that he has given us. In verse 7, it also states and says, tells us that with redemption comes forgiveness. And this is the next point in your outline, is that we are forgiven. Ephesians, back to Ephesians 1, 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. See, without Jesus redeeming us by his blood on the cross, we could never have full atonement and forgiveness of our sins because, uh, because they could not take our place as, oh my gosh, sorry, I am losing my train of thought. <laughs> Because Jesus died on the cross, before Jesus died on the cross, there was limited atonement. And this was done through the sacrificing of animals. There wasn't a complete covering of sins. You see, um, back in uh, Leviticus, it was told that 
uh, for a covering of sins, the Israelites were to put their hand on an animal, which was usually a bull. And in doing so, this was a representation of sin being transferred onto the animal. And then by killing the animal, that sacrifice, that blood debt was um, paid for a short time. And then they would have to continue repeating this process. The writer of Hebrews talks about the, in the insufficiency of, of animal sacrifice in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. Since the law has only a shadow of the good things to come and not the reality itself of those things, it can never perfect the worshipers by the same sacrifices they continually offer year after year. Otherwise, wouldn't they have stopped being offered since the worshipers purified once and for all would no longer have any uh, consciousness of sin? But in the sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins year after year, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. See, where animal sacrifices was not enough to fully cover our sins, to fully forgive once and for all our sins, we needed a Savior. And this was the point, was to show that forgiveness through a Savior was needed because the continual sacrifices year after year after year was to remind them that this is not a full covering. We need full forgiveness. We need a Savior. And that was Jesus. Because Jesus, who was able to live that perfect life, was able to be that atonement for us. Romans chapter 4, verse 6 through 8 says this, Likewise, David also speaks of the blessing of the person to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those who lawless acts are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the person the Lord will never charge with sin. Because of Jesus' redemptive work on the cross, our lawless acts are now fully forgiven given where animal sacrifices were insufficient jesus christ paid that price through his perfect life by dying on the cross and now we have that redemptive work of jesus by the forgiveness of our sins where god never ever will charge us with sin in the last days when we stand before God, we will be able to stand before God and he is not going to condemn us or charge us of our sin because he's going to see Christ in us. He is going to see the work of the redemption that was paid in us if we have put our faith and our trust in Jesus. And when it is says uh, here, it goes on to say that we have this uh, redemption and forgiveness according to the riches of his grace. So the riches of God's grace. This means that God has a plentiful amount of grace, of mercy, of forgiveness. This means that we're not going to wake up one day and God's going to go, you've sinned for the last time. Redemption no longer can work for you now. That's the last straw. That's never going to happen because of the riches of his grace. God's never not going to be able to forgive us. He's always going to be able to because of the riches of his grace. Now, obviously, we don't want to take this as like, oh, I can go do whatever I want now because I have God's grace. I am sinned. That is a wrong thinking. It is through the grace of and the riches of God's mercy that he has given us, this redemption and this forgiveness of sins, that we actually want to be walking in a holy lifestyle, which we'll get to in a little bit. And in this grace that God has richly given us, we're going to go into the next part of our passage in Ephesians, which is Ephesians chapter 1, verse 8 through 9. It says that he richly poured out on us with all wisdom, and understanding. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure 
that he purposed in Christ. You see, God richly poured out his grace and redemption and forgiveness on us with his wisdom and his understanding. I want to make one thing clear, and I don't want I don't want this to be misunderstood, that God did not need wisdom and understanding to bring us redemption and forgiveness of sins. We have redemption and the forgiveness of sins because of God's all wisdom, his all understanding, his all knowing. It's out of his all knowing that God had wisdom and understanding in this grace that he was going to bring us. <clears throat> he knew that animal sacrifices would not be able to fully atone. He knew that we would need a savior to redeem us, to buy us back from being slaves to sin. He knew that he would need to send Jesus, his son, God in human flesh, to die on that cross for our sins. And I want it to be, uh, it is very interesting, and I want you guys to note this, because the very first time the gospel is ever referred to in the scriptures is by God. It's not by man. It is by God. And this is in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, where Jesus says, I will put hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. This is Jesus speaking to Satan when he deceived Eve as the serpent. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. This is God proclaiming the gospel. This is God giving a picture that Jesus is going to defeat Satan by dying on the cross, redeeming us, and buying us back from being slaves of sin. This is also showing in what manner how Satan is actually going to strike Jesus by him being crucified on the cross, dying, shedding his blood. But that strike that Satan gives on Jesus, Jesus is going to use that to actually strike him down and give him a death blow. This is the first mention of the gospel, and it is by God. Because the plan of redemption was not a plan B. It, it wasn't like Jesus, God was going like, oh man, Adam and Eve have sinned. The world's fallen into chaos. They now have death. What do I do? What do I do? Oh, I know. No, there was not a plan B. It was in God's wisdom and foreknowledge and understanding that this was predestined for Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. It was predestined for us to be redeemed. God knew this. And th this, this can go into a huge apologetical question, which I'm not even going to have the time to get into. But I do want to point this out. How much of a loving God do we have that even though he knew that we would sin and mess things up, he still planned ahead before we were even created our redemption and our salvation? That's a loving God, that he still created us. That is a loving God that he thought way ahead by his foreknowledge, the plan of salvation and redemption. I would say, as we're going to go on a little later in our application, is that's a reason to praise God, to worship God. And we'll get into that in a little bit. But through God's wisdom, and understanding, and this is going to be the next point in our outline, is that we have wisdom and understanding. John chapter 1, verse 4 says this, In him, speaking of Jesus, was life, and that life was the light of men. The word light in the Greek has a sense of meaning that it's uh, of enlightenment, understanding. It was wisdom and understanding that was given to the apostles through the life that is in Jesus. The life that is in Jesus that was given to the apostles, they were also given enlightenment. They were giving understanding of the gospel, 
how it works, salvation and redemption. This is how they were able to preach the gospel. This is how they were able, some of the apostles who wrote the epistles and letters that we have today in our Bible, was through the wisdom and understanding that God gave them. It was even wisdom and understanding through the life of Jesus that Paul was able to teach and preach the gospel and the writing of his epistles that we now have in our Bible. And I guys want you to, to, to note this because there's a difference between the, the 12 apostles and Paul. The 12 apostles walked with Jesus. They physically saw him, touched with him, ate with him, physically learned from him. Paul was not a part of that. You see, Paul was given the wisdom and understanding when he came to faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6 through 7 says this. We do, however, speak a wisdom among the mature, but not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age. We are coming or who are coming to nothing. On the contrary, we speak God's hidden wisdom in a mystery, a wisdom God predestined before the ages for our glory. See, because God has given the apostles and Paul this wisdom and this understanding of salvation and redemption and the forgiveness of sins, again, they were able to preach and teach the gospel. But God has also given each one of us, he's given you guys, he's given me, this wisdom and understanding. Now, some of you may not have the spiritual gift of teaching, but you still have the wisdom and the understanding of the gospel, of redemption, of salvation. And none of us are ever going to write an epistle that's going to be added to the Bible, but we still have that wisdom and that understanding of redemption, of salvation, of forgiveness. Proverbs chapter 2, verse 6 says this, For the Lord gives wisdom, from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. Through God's wisdom, he has given us the knowledge and understanding, not just of redemption, salvation, and forgiveness, but how to walk in them, how to walk in redemption, how to walk in salvation, how to walk in our forgiveness. Because as I mentioned earlier, you guys uh, were given that wisdom to know that, that it's not a one and done salvation. It's not a one and done redemption. We're not redeemed. We're not saved and forgiven of sins. So now we can go out and do whatever we want. We are now called to live a certain lifestyle. And that is a lifestyle of holiness to God. And it takes wisdom. It takes understanding in how to walk in that lifestyle. This is why we, when we want to teach when we do our devotionals that it's not only just um, getting context and interpretation of the verse, it's getting application and how to apply it to our everyday life. That comes with wisdom and understanding. And God has given us that. But not only did God give wisdom and understanding of the gospel, he gave us a wisdom of, and an understanding of a mystery that for a long time nobody ever thought about or even remotely understood. And that is that, and there's a point in your next outlines, is Gentiles are included in salvation and God's promise. Because when it, it was, as it says up here uh, in in verse uh, 6 through 7 of uh, as, that, as it is said that uh, he made known the mystery of his will in our Ephesians passage, right? And that mystery of his will is that Gentiles are included in salvation and God's promise. Colossians chapter 1 verse 27 says, God wanted to make known among the Gentiles the glorious wealth of his mystery, which is in Christ in you, the hope of glory. 
So God made known to us Gentiles, anybody who is not Jewish, and those who are not of salvation. He wanted to make known to us Gentiles redemption and the forgiveness of our sins. This was a mystery, and it's called a mystery because in the Jewish culture, it was not even a thought that salvation could be for Gentiles. It was not even a thought that salvation would go to Gentiles. We, have, uh, we see an example of this in Acts chapter 10 uh, to uh, chapter 11, verse 18. And I don't have this up on the screen because this is a pretty long uh, verse, so I'm just going to summarize it for you. This is when Peter uh, had a vision of a white sheet coming down and all different kind of animals on it, clean and unclean. And Jesus speaks to Peter and tells him, Peter, rise, kill, and eat. But as Peter normally does, puts his foot in his mouth, and was like, Lord, I have never eaten or touched anything unclean. And he's basically, I'm not about to start now. So Jesus, as Jesus normally did, took Peter's foot out of his mouth. And he tells him, do not call anything unclean that I have called clean. But Peter would later on realize why or what this vision meant. And he would find this out when he was summoned and told by Jesus to go to a Gentile's house, a Roman centurion soldier by the name of Cornelius, to preach the gospel. So when, when Peter finds out why he's there while talking to Cornelius, Cornelius, he realizes like, oh, I am to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. And Peter realizes what that vision was about. Because here's what Peter says in Acts chapter 10, verse 34 through 35, but again, it's not on the screen, but it says, Peter began to speak. Now I truly understand that God doesn't show favoritism, but in every nation, the person who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. See, in God's wisdom and understanding, he brought the gospel to the Gentile, to us non-Jews. He brought salvation and redemption to us through his plan. This was his plan all along. God wasn't just like, oh, you know what? Uh, there's the Jews over here, and then, you know, I think I'm just going to kind of like throw the Gentiles in here with the Jews. No, that was plan A all along. It wasn't an afterthought. It was a before thought. It was planned. Romans chapter 16, verse 25 to 26 says this, now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the proclamation about Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery kept silent for long ages, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic scriptures, according to the command of the eternal God to advance the obedience of faith among the Gentiles. See, as I said earlier, it was God's plan all along for Gentiles to come to faith in Jesus Christ, to be able to be redeemed, have the forgiveness of sins, have that wisdom and understanding that comes with it. You see, where Gentiles were once far off from God, they didn't have the law, they didn't have the, the giving of the sacrificing of animals and the different feasts and the celebrations. The Jews did. And Gentiles, yes, could um, be uh, brought into that through certain rituals and being circumcised and all that, but it was originally for the Jews. And we were far off from God. We were without hope. We were without salvation. But in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11 through 14, which I'm not going to fully dissect because in the weeks to come, we are going to go through this in our sermon series. But Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11 through 14 says this. So then remember that at one time you were Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcised, by those called the circumcised, which is done in the flesh by human hands. And at that time you were without Christ, excluded from the citizenship of Israel and foreigners to the covenant and promise without hope and without God in the world. 
But now in Christ Jesus, you who were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace who made both groups one and tore down the dividing wall of hostility in the flesh. You see, this redemption work that we have in Jesus and in the wisdom and understanding of God and the wisdom and understanding that he has given us, where there were two separate bodies, Jews, Gentiles, by the death of Jesus on the cross and the redemption work, he has now made one body, both made up of Jews and Gentiles. And to close out um, our passage here in Ephesians, through the redemption, the forgiveness of sins, and God's wisdom and understanding, we also have a hope. In Ephesians, uh, and the, the next, sorry, the next on your outlines is that all things will be reconciled in Christ. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10. And uh, our passage says this, As a plan for the right time to bring everything together in Christ, both things in heaven and things on earth in him. So we have a now hope of the redemption that we have now, the forgiveness that we have now, but we also have a hope in that all things are going to be reconciled in Christ. This is is talking about the redemption and the reconciliation of the earth also. See Romans chapter 8 verse 19 through 22 says this, for creation eagerly waits with anticipation for God's son to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in the hope that the creation itself will also be set free from the bondage of a bondage to decay into the glorious freedom of God's children. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together with labor pains until now. See, a lot of times I think, and even I'm guilty of this, that we only think of redemption when it pertains to us. We only think of reconciliation to God when it comes to our relationship to God. But here in Romans is talking about the redemption and the reconciliation of the earth as well. And this is talking about the new heaven and the new earth and the new Jerusalem. Because just as we have fallen, because just as we have a fallen nature due to sin and we suffer because of sin, the world has been fallen into the bondage of decay because of sin. This is why we have natural disasters, earthquakes. It wasn't supposed to be that way. This is why when we have lightning striking down, destroying homes and causing us to lose power. I didn't lose power, thank God. At least I don't think I did. I wasn't there. but This is why we have hurricanes. Because... The earth is in chaos. It wasn't meant to be this way. But God is going to redeem the earth. He is going to reconcile the earth. Galatia, or sorry, Colossians chapter 1, verse 19 through 20 says this For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile everything to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. See, God is going to reconcile everything to himself through Jesus Christ. This includes the earth and the new heaven and the new earth. There is going to come a day where our chaotic world, full of natural disasters, the groaning of the earth, as we're going to see here, as we saw here, is going to come to a perfect order in a perfect creation where God originally created it and intended it to be. So this is a hope that we have to look forward to. We already have the hope of our redemption. 
we already have the hope of forgiveness. We have a hope to look forward to in the new heaven and the new earth where this world will be perfect, just as it was originally created, where we will live in it for eternity. Isaiah 11, uh, chapter 6, I'm sorry, Isaiah chapter 11, verses 6 through 9 says this, The wolf will dwell with the lamb, and the leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf, the young lion, and the fatted calf will be together, and a child will lead them. The cow and bear will graze, the young ones will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like cattle. An infant will play beside the cobra's pit, and a toddler will put his hand into a snake's den. They will not harm or destroy each other and my entire on my entire holy mountain. For the land will be as full of the knowledge of the Lord as the sea is filled with water. So there's going to come a day where everything that is out of order, everything that wasn't supposed to be, is going to be made right. Um, not too long ago, like last year, some of you may have known this story. There was a bear that wandered onto the property me and Glenn live on, right? And I'm going to be fully honest, bears freak me out, okay? They terrify me. I have never seen one up close before. I have never had to live in a place where I have to worry about one. This thing was huge. I mean, it tipped over Glenn's uh, field kitchen. <laughs> That's pretty big. They scare me because their claws are huge, their teeth, they can run about up to I think 60 miles an hour, 30 miles an hour. I can't run that fast, so I'm not outrunning it, right? But there's going to come a day where I don't have to worry about bears on my property and breaking in my door and eating me at night. <laughs> what was that? Oh, yeah, because we're going to have everything in working order as it should. As it says here, the bear is going to graze with the fatted calf. Everything is going to be in working order as it should have been when God first created the world. And to close it out with um, our practical application, this is why we worship. We worship God because he has redeemed us through the blood of Christ. We worship God because he made a way where, where he paid our debt that we could not pay where we were destined for eternal damnation as payment, God made the way for us to live eternal life. This is why we worship him. We worship him because of the forgiveness that we have through redemption, where we no longer have to sacrifice animals and be reminded yearly after yearly that this is not enough. We are still in our sins. You know how discouraging that would be? Can you imagine the discouragement? Like, Lord, when are you going to come? When are you going to save us from our sins and redeem us? This is why we worship, because we have that now. We have that encouragement. We have that hope. We also worship God. And I also want to say we don't only just worship God in praise and worship and singing to him or in service. As I said earlier, we also now worship God by living a lifestyle of holiness. Because as the Bible says, when we do that, that is our true worship. That is our worship. Because God has made a way for us to be redeemed and saved, we need to live in that lifestyle. And we need to do it, and we do it as a worship to God. We also worship God because of the wisdom and understanding that he had in his all-knowing in making this plan A, not a plan B. We worship God because in his wisdom and understanding, he has given us wisdom and understanding of the gospel, of redemption, of salvation. We also worship him because as Gentiles, we have been brought into the fold of God. We have been brought close to God where we were once far. We also worship God because 
he is eventually going to reconcile all things to him. We, we worship him as we look forward to that hope of the new heaven and the new earth. So I'm going to go ahead and pray, and the worship team is going to come back up. And we're going to sing one more worship song. So as we sing this worship song, let's remember so far the, the blessings, the spiritual blessings that God has given us in Christ as believers. Let that be a reason for our worship. As we sang earlier, Jesus paid it all. We're worshiping because Jesus paid it all. We literally have 10,000 reasons why to worship. This list is not exhaustive that we're going through. So let's go ahead and pray, and then we're going to worship with one more song.